Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Evan Placey's play Jekyll and Hyde, which is a very loose adaptation of the Robert Louis Stevenson novel. For me, the... So, broadly speaking, there's there are similarities here. The, the theme of transformation um, and the idea of using a potion to release one's inhibited self one's id if you want uh in in psychoanalytic terminology those are elements here but thematically this play is very very different from robert louis stevenson's novel largely in that this is reimagined this play premieres in 2017 is really reimagined for the era of the Me Too movement and the women's marches. In a way that I find somewhat problematic, um, and, and I'll tell you why in just a little bit, but we've got a massive thematic divergence here between Stevenson's novel and Placey's play, largely in that in Stevenson's novel, the central theme is releasing the id, releasing one's darker self. And so Stevenson's Hyde gratifies his own worst impulses for violence, presumably for sex, for doing drugs, perhaps. It's not entirely clear necessarily uh, what all he gets up to. But it's entirely about his own gratification. There's no larger concerns that Hyde has. No social conscience or something like this. Whereas, in Placey's version... So, so, first off, Dr. Henry Jekyll has died before this play begins. And his work is picked up by his widow, um, Hattie Hyde, uh, Hattie Jekyll, sorry, Hattie, yes, I think, um, Harriet, Hattie, yeah, I think, um, it, so his work is picked up by his widow, she perfects the serum in a way that Henry did not, uh, and he, he died basically by taking a serum that didn't work. Uh, Hattie perfects it, apparently, even though she has no scientific knowledge, uh, basically just working from his notes. And she splits herself between mild-mannered Victorian widow Hattie Jekyll and party girl slash free love enthusiast slash murderer slash avenger of women Flossie Jekyll alongside this storyline primarily in the second act of this play we have the story of Florence Monroe who is arrested uh, at the end actually of act one after we see Hyde murder a policeman uh, a policeman who incidentally was came into this bar to do... Back in the day, they had these incredibly invasive um, medical checks where basically uh, police would at random round up prostitutes or suspected prostitutes and then check them for venereal disease. And basically it was... Uh, there was a lot of sexual assault that went along with it. There was a lot of violations of what we would now think of as civil liberties. Um, and there was very little that was necessarily done about the men who went and visited prostitutes. It was, it was almost exclusively directed at prostitutes. And that's what this police officer comes into the bar to do. 
when Hyde challenges him, he basically says, everybody else leave, I'm going to arrest you. He then essentially attempts to extort sex from her, and she stabs him in the neck um, with a, a hat pin and stabs him repeatedly. Florence Monroe, in the modern scenes, so the modern and the, the Victorian sort of overlap and blend in a really interesting way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. Um, Florence Monroe, who is in the modern storyline, gets arrested for this murder largely because <clears throat> she's been writing fan fiction, essentially. But she's, she's written a blog which has a lot of sort of militant feminist thoughts but she's she's careful about this uh, because she actually talks with we get extensive um, depiction of her interrogations by the police and one of the things that she had learned when she had come into the police about a year earlier after receiving a number of threats online is that if if something written online is phrased in terms of a desire or a fantasy, I wish X thing would happen, as opposed to saying someone go out and do this thing, then that person can't be held responsible. So when she was getting threats, like, let me see if I can uh, find it. Um, and this, I mean, this is graphic, so it's worth noting that, uh, she get, she gets, uh, she brought to the police this message. I wish someone would rape her and glue her slutty mouth shut. And unfortunately, uh, given how fucking terrible a place the internet is, uh, this is an extremely common kind of thing for people who talk about uh, women's rights, particularly women who talk about women's rights or um, support for immigrants, uh, Black Lives Matter, etc., etc. Extraordinarily graphic threats, often including sexual violence, are disgustingly common. And what the police had told her at the time was because it was phrased as, I wish that, there was nothing they could do because it wasn't really a threat. It wasn't uh, somebody telling her they were going to do something, something like this. And so she, when she writes her blog posts, and some of them are sort of saying, I wish violence would happen. I wish particular individuals would experience X thing, whatever it is. She always phrases it in terms of, I wish that this would happen. But the reason that they've brought her in is because there's a militant feminist group called Fembot that uh, has been attacked, that has murdered a policeman uh, and that are, that have committed these various crimes uh, all of which align with the things that Florence Monroe has written. So this is actually, and, and we eventually find, and initially Florence denies any knowledge of this or connection to this or whatever it is. Um, at the very end of the play, we actually find out she is involved and, and she has this very lengthy confession speech where essentially she says because I was victimized in this way and the police who were supposed to protect me did nothing because women are systematically uh, denied rights, denied medical care uh, because trans women, LGBT women, etc, etc are turned back at, uh, at the borders <clears throat> sent back to their own countries where they are often raped, murdered, tortured, whatever it is, I took it upon myself to create this underground militant feminist movement 
that would destroy patriarchal society and so that we women could rebuild society in a way that's just and safe for us. So we have this confession at the end. So one thing, again, this is completely different than what we get in Stevenson's novel, where there's no social consciousness whatsoever. Here we have both Hyde and Florence Monroe using violence for social goals, socio-political goals, to uh, strike back at the patriarchal systems that oppress women, etc., etc. And to be clear, the play is the play is aware of the ethical ambiguities of this type of stance. Neither Hyde nor Monroe are presented as unqualified heroes here. They are both flawed characters, and yet the socio-political problems and the, the problems of patriarchy that they point out are very, very real problems. And, I mean, this play came out in 2017 when the Me Too movement was really at the center of people's political consciousness in a way that unfortunately now as we I'm, I'm filming this at the very end of 2021 it'll probably get posted in early 2022 and the me too movement is not unfortunately as central in people's consciousness as it is as it was in 2017 though many of the problems still exist and so Hyde in this version and Monroe are using violence to achieve a larger objective. It's not just Edward Hyde's gratification of his own violent and sexual impulses. So that's a major, major difference in terms of, of these two texts. I'm also... I think there's a potential problem here, and I, I'm on the fence about this because, especially given the fact that Evan Placey is a male playwright, the fembot movement with the uh, emasculation of various doctors who, who refuse to perform abortions, political leaders, uh, who have who have uh, turned back trans and LGBT uh, refugees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the emasculation, the murder of these people, along with the the sort of general anarchic violence of the fembot movement in this play, kind of is the patriarchal nightmare of what the Me Too movement and women's marches could have been. And I think actually at the time, there were right-wing commentators especially who tried to compare the Me Too movement and um, the women's marches and things like this to terrorists, which indeed in this play, the police make the argument that they are. And so... Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about that because it puts on stage the, the fantasy of women's liberation as a violent, dangerous, socially unstable movement. And that, I'm not sure that that that's a great thing to do. I mean, the obviously that's not what happened with Me Too and the women's marches and things like this. But to play into that fantasy of like, oh, women are trying to emasculate men, they're trying to destroy society, etc., etc., it's hugely problematic, I think, especially coming from a male playwright because, again, 
those are the kinds of cultural narratives that lead people to oppose, even lead other women in, in many cases to oppose things like Me Too and the women's marches and things like this. So I think it's very, very problematic to sort of give vent to that and even potentially legitimize those patriarchal fantasies of, of feminist violence. The other thing I want to talk about with this play is, that I think is actually really cool as well is the Brechtian elements here. Um, so... In the play, there's a lot of stuff that breaks up the illusion that we're seeing a set of events in the Victorian era. So there's these sort of weird individual moments, for instance, where Jekyll uh, refers to the Gestapo which obviously didn't come into existence until Nazi Germany. And so for a Victorian, that term would have no meaning. Um, we've got these bits where um, uh, text speak is used, or like emoticons are like spelled out verbally by characters, but it, Evans explain or not Evans, sorry, uh, Placey explains in the opening portion that this is meant to be done almost naturalistically. Like these, um, so in, in this, in the introduction, he writes, from the first, when Jekyll mentions the Gestapo and Utterson queries it, just let it be the weird moment the characters feel it is. A short jolt, and then move on. Same goes for Josephine's glitch. And play the truth of the text speak. For example, when Gertrude says XX colon dash star, she should play the meaning of that, which is kiss, kiss, kissy face emoticon, rather than being robotic or odd about it. So that's a really interesting technique, because one might argue that Brecht might actually say no let the actor be robotic and odd about it because i mean brecht was all about breaking that illusion so placey has done something slightly more subtle here where he's given us something that i would say definitely breaks up the illusion that we're seeing something naturalistic or victorian here but at the same time he's asking that actors play it down so that it's not sort of like so that it's not the actor stepping outside the character and saying here's a thing that i the actor am doing on behalf of this character which is kind of the brecht thing instead it's here's just an odd thing that signals to you that something is not right here you're not seeing the Victorian age as it was, or whatever it is. Um, but the other thing that we've got that's really Brechtian here is um, title slides, or screens, or projections, or whatever it is. Uh, so in the original production run, this was done via projector, but there's other ways you could do it conceptually. Um, so often these occur between scenes. So between Act 1, Scene 2, and Act 1, Scene 3, we see the titles Jekyll and Hyde, Chapter 1, A Visit from Detective Utterson. And that's another very Brechtian technique. It's a, another way of pointing out that we're seeing something constructed and that what we're seeing has important meaning. And this, of course, connect, the idea of, of Brechtian epic theater, of course, connects back to the way that Placey is is dealing with uh, the Me Too movement and the women's marches, because Brecht's epic theater was all about getting people to think about their own socio-political or cultural or economic conditions from the perspective of historical difference. So 
like you would have a Brechtian play set in say the Thirty Years' War, but really it's about the themes for mid twentieth century Germany and what Brecht tries to prompt people audience members to do is to reflect on if I were in that situation what would I do if I were in Mother Courage's situation what would I do and then that is supposed to prime them for thinking about in my own situation in my own context here's what I should do Placey is doing the same kind of thing here what would we do if we were in the position of Patty Jekyll? And therefore, what would we do if we were in the position of Florence Monroe? If we were in the position of a early 21st century woman during <clears throat> the age of the Me Too movement and the Women's March?